I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, so, uh, no, I want to welcome you to First United Methodist Church Midlothian. I'm Pastor Brady Johnston, and uh, and excited to celebrate this fourth week of the season of Advent together with you as we get ready for this week and all that this week means for us. We have, of course, coming up um, Christmas Eve, and then. Um, Christmas will be here together in a week's time, and so we have a great week ahead of us as we have spent weeks anticipating the birth of Jesus and the gift of, of Christ and his life for us. Uh, we come together this day to celebrate him and to worship him and to again turn our attention to Bethlehem and the gift of his coming down to us as one of us, that we might know the heart and the love of God. Um, and so I thank you for being here. If you're visiting with us online or in person, we're so glad you're here. And if you're a first-time guest, we're so thankful you chose to spend this sacred season with us. And so we look forward to sharing in this time together. Uh, with that, I'm going to invite the Pattersons to come up and to read uh, for our Advent reading and to light our candle. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7 says, A child is born to us, a son is given to us, and authority will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. We light this candle as a symbol of the Prince of Peace. May the visitation of your Holy Spirit, O oh God, make us ready for the coming of Jesus, our hope and joy. O oh come, O oh come, Emmanuel. Now will you please stand with us as we sing our first hymn of the day, O Come All Ye Faithful. heard on high is our next hymn.
release our children in the congregation to godly play. If you'll come forward, we'll lead you to godly play. There's Miss Hayden. Now, if you'll join me, you may stay seated, and if you'll join me in singing Emmanuel. If you'll please stand and join me in the affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Almighty God, we gather before you in your presence, and we thank you for all that you have done for us, for who you are. We thank you for your heart, which continues to pour out love for us and for your creation. We are grateful for your heart and your plans for redemption that lead us here to the foot of the cross in anticipation of not only this Jesus who has come to us long ago, but who will come again to us to restore this world, to heal the broken world, and to bring it back under under your great rule. Uh, We love you. We thank you. We come to offer our gifts of gratitude and thanksgiving for you, and may you receive it out of the love in which we have given it. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Let us pray this morning. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp, make music to him on the ten-string lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. The word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all that he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. And by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Their starry hosts by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the seas into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the people. The plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. 
the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven, the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse, is, a horse in a vain hope for deliverance, despite all of its great strength, it cannot save. The eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in the unfailing love. Deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait and hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Lord, we thank you for this moment as we just lean into the Psalms and appreciate how magnificent you are. Appreciate where we stand in reference to you and what we must do to stand up straight and what we must do to have your eyes upon us. And oh, how our lives would need a change. And our hearts need to be opened up just that much more. For he is the God that gives us all opportunity to follow, to be, to rejoice in him. And all we need do is say yes. All we need do is say, I believe that you are the God of all promises. You keep those promises, Lord. Throughout the ages, we've seen it over and over again in our own lives. We know that we are nothing without you. We need you in every step that we make because you can hold us up straight and you can allow all that hurts us to fall away. You allow us to take one step at a time with you so that you can guide us on this path because we can't do it without you. We need your love to live. We need your love to change. We need your love to change us. We need your love so that we can take that love and apply it to other people. And just as you've loved us enough to give us a savior, can't we love you enough to love others in the exact same way? And as we are being guided, we know that we will never follow that path perfectly. We know we can't step in, in the exact footsteps of your son. But we also know that we have a prayer that Jesus has used with his first of disciples and continues to open us up when we say it so that we can be reminded of the most important things we need to know as disciples. And let us say it this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and glory forever. Amen. Of the Father's love begotten, ere the worlds began to be, He is Alpha and Omega, 
He the source, the ending he of the things that are that have been and that future you shall see evermore and evermore. O ye heights of heaven, adore him. Angel host his praises sing. Past your minions bow before him and extol our God and King. Let no tongue on earth be silent. Every voice in concert sing. Evermore and evermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Stephanie. I've already heard some comments this morning. Um, many of you know that this last week, my family, we went to Disney World for the first time. So... Uh, we spent six weeks, six weeks, six, it felt like six weeks. <laughs> it was <laughs> six days in, in the various parks. My girls who are seven and nine made it their mission to, to visit every princess that ever emerged from Walt Disney's imagination. And we met every one of them and some of them multiple times. And so uh, we landed Friday night at, I guess we got back about midnight and so I realized this morning when I woke up, like my energy is somewhere back in Florida. So uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to make it through today because we have a, a great verse. Um, and it's one that we're, many of us are familiar with. It's not a verse we tend to use a lot for Advent. So it may seem a little strange that we're looking to John 3.16. But, but it's a verse that, that's familiar to many of us. And in fact, uh, whether you've been in church all your life or this is your first time ever at church, you, you have likely encountered John 3.16 on some level. And in fact, there are some of us, and maybe even many of us here, who have John 3.16 even memorized. And I know that I memorized John 3.16 in fourth grade because my fourth grade Sunday school teacher, you know, slash drill sergeant, Miss <laughs> Lucy, made it her goal for us to memorize John 3.16. She didn't care if we remembered her name or not. That wasn't important to her. But anyone who stepped foot in Miss Lucy's fourth grade Sunday school class would know John 3.16 by heart. And for many of us, we have that kind of familiarity with John 3.16. For some of us, it may be somewhat new, but, but for many of us, there's some familiarity. But my question for us today is, do we understand it? And we may have it memorized. We may be able to say it just like the Lord's Prayer without even thinking about it. But do we really know what, what is meant by the words of John 3.16? And, and that's kind of our goal today is to walk through, to kind of take it little by little, to make sure that we understand what this verse tells us, especially in a season as sacred as Advent. And the first thing I want you to do in understanding this verse is if you have your Bible with you, open to John 3.16. Um, and if you use your phone as your Bible, the Lord still loves you. That's, that's good news. Uh, no, it's fine. Uh, you can take that out and look at it as well. And the first thing I want you to notice is I want you to look down and to see if the words are red or they're black. So, so for many of us, we have in our Bibles, the, the words of Jesus are highlighted in red, uh, where the words of the authors of the books themselves are contained or black. And so I want you to look down. Do you see those words in red or black? Red. Okay. So many of them, yeah, many versions have these words in red, and those versions are wrong. Uh, no, I'm just te it's teasing. Um, <clears throat> Well, I mean, maybe they are. If you actually look at the words themselves and you actually look at the verses 16 kind of following through the rest of this, this part, portion of the chapter, you see that they're very distinct from the conversation that Jesus has with Nicodemus. And so really the common thinking today is that this isn't Jesus' words. These aren't words that come out of the mouth of Jesus, but rather they're words reflecting on Jesus' ministry and his mission. 
that they come from John, the gospel writer, as he reflects on this conversation that Jesus has with Nicodemus and the implications of what Jesus tells him for everybody, for the whole world, including you and including me. And, and so whether, whether you think they're Jesus' words or not are really that, not that important. Um, but we're going to look at him from that sense of, of John's commentary on what he's telling us about who Jesus is and what he's come to do. I'm glad I didn't offend anybody out of the church already before we even get to the verse. So, <clears throat> But let's look at these words. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. As we look at these words and kind of take them little by little, one of the first things that we notice is that that as John tries to help process what Jesus has come to do, the first thing that he looks at is the heart of God. And what he says in looking at the heart of God is, for God so loved the world. It's the first thing that he notes, for God so loved the world. And I think as we we begin to look at this first portion, this first kind of phrase of this verse, we kind of ask ourselves, well, what does John mean by love? What does he envision when he talks about God loving or having loved the world? And it's important for us to do this because the way that John understands love and the way he portrays it in his gospel and then his letters that will come in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John is vastly different than the way we tend to hear love often today. In our culture, when we think about the shows we watch and and the things we read, most often we hear love and we hear love phrased as kind of emotions and feelings. And, and we think of, of love as falling in love and the feelings that you get when you feel in love. In fact, more often than not, when, when I see love on TV, it's likened to the latest reality show where they put pretty young people together in groups in highly emotional states and just watch them all fall in love. And, and that's the kind of fun drama that a lot of us really kind of enjoy. I remember when Annie and I were dating and, and she was in college at UT, and on Thursday nights, I would go and sit with her and her other five roommates, and we would watch The Bachelor. <laughs> because that's what you do when, when you're in love. You make these kind of sacrifices. And, and I remember the season that we watched together. Like, the guy fell in love with, like, three girls, right? Like, it was just, everybody was just like, oh, how romantic, you know, that he could fall in love. His heart was so big to love so many people. No, it was just emotions. Like, it was feelings. And when John says, for God so loved the world, he's not talking about that kind of emotions and that kind of feelings. In fact, John uses the word agape to describe the, the love of God for the world. And agape is not emotions, it's not feelings. Although desire can be encompassed in agape love, agape love, in a sense, is about choice. That agape love is about the will. It is about someone choosing to give value and to love another. And the beautiful part about agape love and what makes it it unconditional and I think so powerful is that it's not based on the recipient of love earning it. It's not based on, on the one who is being loved being lovely. It is based purely on the one who chooses to love still choosing to love. That's agape love. And now I realize for you romantics out there, you're thinking, man, you just, you know, pop my balloon like that. That doesn't sound romantic at all. Love is just a choice. But there's something beautiful about that, because what that means is that it it actually is based on something that has enough substance to support a real relationship. Like if you've been around long enough to know and experience that, that, look, emotions and feelings are not stable enough to build a real, true, lasting relationship upon. 
emotions and feelings, man, those things come and go. But agape love, as, as John holds out in front of us in, in describing the heart of God, is beautiful in the sense that it's based not on feelings and emotions that come and go. It's based on one's character. And what John says to us is that the love of God for you and for me and for all the world is based on his unending, unchanging character. And, and that for us is a beautiful, a beautiful reality. It may or may not be as romantic as, as you would like, but it's powerful. And, and that's what John wants us to understand. John says to us, look, when he says God so loved, John is saying that's who God is. That in the core of his being, that if you want to understand who God is in the very nature of himself, then you have to understand that he is one who loves, one who chooses time and time again out of who he is to love. And that's why so often when the Bible talks about love, it talks about covenant love. Because covenant love is about commitment. It's about being the kind of person who chooses to love. And, and what this tells us is, is it tells us far more about who God is than it does about us. Because covenant love is about loving somebody even sometimes in spite of themselves. And for those of you that are married, and we, we use this same kind of covenant love imagery in marriage. Because you know if you're actually going to be married to somebody, you're going to have to at some point love them in spite of them. That's just the nature of relationship, right? Like, if you can't, then your marriage isn't going to last. If it's just, ba- I got an amen out of that. Well, my goodness. Whew, y'all are, the Holy Spirit's moving today. All right, we're getting this. Like, yeah, like, you're, you're someone's going to be in trouble for that one, but that's all right. It, but really, like, like, love has to be built on something more than just the emotions and the feeling. And that's why the Bible talks about God's love as agape love, as a covenant love, because he is the kind of one who chooses to love in spite of you and me. And the beautiful thing about that is that means that we can trust the love of God for us. And there's some of us out there who need to hear that today. Because you're saying, well, that's great that God loves the world, but what about me? Like, don't you know me and don't you know what I've done? If God knows those things like the Bible says he does, there's no way that he loves me. And and what John tells us here in the very beginning is he's summarizing the heart of God. He says, God is the kind of God who chooses love. And that tells us something about him, that he chooses love, that it doesn't even matter whether or not you are lovely or, or, or lovable. He is the God who chooses to love, who is committed to choosing to love. That is his heart. That is his nature. And it's not changing. And the beautiful thing about this is that this love is not just for for some. It's a love that's universal. To use Jesus' words about the love of God in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, God's love is complete in that it's shared to all of creation, to everything that God has made. For God so loved the world. And as John continues to help us understand Jesus' mission and ministry, he, he moves on to the next phrase. And what he does in this is he, he builds on the understanding of agape love. By showing us what this kind of love does. He says that he gave his one and only son. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and his only son. You see, what agape love does is it is rooted in action. In fact, biblical love, you see this from the beginning through the end of Scripture, We see that love, as the Bible understands it, whether in Hebrew or Greek, is based in action. That it's always concrete. It's not something that's abstract, like feelings and emotions that we can't ever quite, quite get a hold of. Like it's based on concrete action of moving toward the other. 
in ways that are seen and evidenced. And, and we see this here. He says that the, the, the tangible action of why you and I can know that God does indeed love the world, that he does indeed choose to love the world, was that he gave. The tangible action of giving. And not only did he give, but he gave something that was precious to him. In fact, that which was most precious to him in the gift of his son. And and part of what makes this season of Advent so beautiful for us is that we celebrate the tangible manifestation of God's love. And that Jesus, the Son of God, was born to us as one of us. That you and I would know the love and the redeeming power of God. And we talk about this every season of Advent of Jesus having been born to us. And uh, every Advent, I want to make it my mission to be able to articulate the, the mystery and the beauty of what it means that the Son of God laid aside all the benefits of his divinity and took upon himself human flesh. And and not only did he take upon himself human flesh and all the frailties of life that we lament often and more often the older we get, but he became as helpless for a time as a child. I mean, think about that for a moment. One thing tells us about agape love is that agape love is, is vulnerable, incredibly vulnerable. Because it's based on one who chooses to love in spite of the recipient of love, man, it puts you at a very vulnerable place. Yesterday I was outside in my house and my girls were playing and our neighbor came over and she had her first child about three months ago, a little girl, just absolutely beautiful. Um, But every time we talk, we talk about what it means to have a newborn and It's always fun, at least once you've gotten past the newborn stage, to watch other parents go through the newborn stage. And because you see just like how much it upends your life. Like your whole life for a time revolves around this helpless little thing. Like you have to do everything for it. And and, and it doesn't even survive or move without your intervention in the child's life. And just every Advent season, it baffles me that Jesus would set aside those things to become truly helpless and dependent upon the very creation and submit to the very created order that he put into being. And that's incredible to think. And the Apostle Paul in Philippians 2, he reflects upon the humility of Jesus that he would come and submit to the very order of life that he put into existence, that he would become as helpless as a child. And it says that he, he submitted, that he, he took upon himself the form of a slave, of a servant, by being made in human likeness. And and what John says here is, look, the love of God is evidenced in this. The love of Jesus is a sure thing because he, he set aside all the privileges of his divinity to become a child, to be born among you, to live for you. Like, that's the evidence. And that God would give his son over knowing very well the entire story before it was lived out in front of us, is evidence of the heart of God's love for for us and for the world. That for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And, And John continues, after stating this just statement of grace, he he says that that whosoever Believes in him. Whosoever believes in him. 
Uh, and, and this is one of those words, the idea of belief here has is, is garnered a lot of attention, and there's a lot of different ideas about what people bring out, about what he means by belief. And, and really, it's Jesus who gives us the understanding of what John means here by believing in Jesus. And it comes actually in the verses just before this. Jesus defines belief in John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And, and I'll share the verse with you, and then I'll provide some context, because it's going to sound a little obscure for some of us. But Jesus, in his conversation with Nicodemus, says this about belief. He says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Now, the story that's being referenced here comes from Numbers chapter 21. The idea of Moses lifting up the snake comes from this really interesting story in Numbers chapter 21. Um, Numbers just has a number of stories that makes you just say, what? You know, you know, like, I can't believe that that happened. And this is one of those stories. And what we find God's people are in the desert. They're wandering in the desert. And we find them kind of in this place of of sin. They have this kind of sinful, antagonistic spirit against God. They're not listening to God. They don't want to listen to God. And so what God does is he sends snakes into their camp. And and what these snakes represent is a manifestation of their sin. Because as these snakes go into the camp, they bite people, and some people get sick, and some people die. And what God is saying by this is he's saying, look, your sin is killing you. I want to lead you to life, but, but your sin, your stubborn, stubborn spirit, like it is literally killing you. And, and the reality is that God's people, to get on the right track, needed something as visible and real and concrete as this to understand the state of their souls. Because you know, and I know from our own experience, that, that oftentimes our own sin can go unseen. We can be blind to our sin and its effects in our life. And so God shows them, your sin is literally killing you. And the people were smart enough to see this. And and when they get bit by the snakes, they turn to Moses and they say, we are sorry, we have sinned against you, we have sinned against God, pray for us. In the same way that if you got bit by a snake, chances are you're not going to ignore it, right? You're going to go to the hospital. So they go to Moses. They ask, they repent, and they ask for Moses to pray. And Moses does. He prays. And God gives Moses these these kind of really interesting instructions. Um, In order to help the people repent, God tells Moses to, to fashion a snake, the image of a snake, on a pole and to set that pole um, in the middle of their camp. And he says, when anyone is is bit by the snake, all they have to do is turn and look at the snake and live. And this is a really amazing idea because, because some people were so sick they couldn't move. They were so sick they couldn't muster up the strength to walk or to crawl to the snake, to to bow down before this in any way. All they could do was simply turn over and look at the middle of the camp. And it was simply by their looking to this object, this manifestation of their sin, facing it, that they would be given new life. Moses' instructions to the people is just look at the snake, and live. And so Jesus grabs hold of this story that the people would, would know well in their hearts. And he said, just like that snake was lifted up so that the people who were sick could live, so I will be lifted up. Not on a pole, but on a cross. So that you could look to me in the midst of your sickness and find life. And that's the gospel and what it means to believe. And we believe that Jesus became the manifestation of your sins and mine, the sins of the world, took that upon himself and was lifted up for us 
and, and to find the gift of new life, to not, not perish, to not die because of the consequences of our sin. We, we look to him. We just simply look to him. And, and that's enough to look to him and, and we're given new life. And that's what John holds out here after hearing these words of Jesus. John brings it back again. That's why I think this comes from John. Because John states it again so that you and I won't miss it. You you want life if you don't want to, to kill yourself in your own sin. Then you look to the Son, the one who's become your sin for you, to be a sacrifice for you, and you'll find life. It's to look at your sin and to realize, look, I'm, I'm messed up, I'm, I'm broken, and I'm in need of grace, and I have nowhere to turn. I can't fix myself. I've tried. I'm just going to look to the one who I believe can actually give me life. And I believe that just by, by looking at him, he can give me the life that's truly life. And John wants to make sure that those who encounter his gospel Everyone who reads it, everyone who hears it proclaimed, understands that. That if you want to live, you look to the Son. John said those who do that will not perish but have eternal life. Eternal life. Now for many of us, when we hear the the word eternal life, we have a very specific thing in mind. And, and for many of us, we look at this and we think, well, that means that, that I will have life when I die, that when I take my last breath here on this earth, I'll take a new breath in heaven, and that's when eternal life will start for me. It's after I die and leave this earth and go to be with God. And in John's gospel, that's not eternal life. It's part of it. But John's definition of eternal life is actually much bigger than that. And if we want to understand what John means, what Jesus means when he talks about eternal life here, then a lot of us are going to have to make some room in our minds for this definition that's probably been cemented in there to understand what Jesus means, what John means as well, when they talk about eternal life. And we find a great definition for eternal life and. John chapter 17, verse 3, and it comes from Jesus. That's why we know we can trust it. In John chapter 17, Jesus is about to go to the cross, and he's praying. He prays for his disciples, for the 12. After he prays for them, he prays for you and me. He prays for all the believers. And then he finally prays to to his Father. And in John chapter 17, verse 3, here's what Jesus says. He, he, he says um, that he has come to give eternal life to all those the Father has given him. And in verse 3, here's what he says. Now, this is eternal life. He defines it. When he says, I've come to give eternal life to everyone that you, my Father, have given me, he says, I want to make sure they understand what eternal life is. And he says, this is eternal life. That they, meaning you and me, May know you the one true God and the one whom you sent. That they may know the one true God and the one whom he has sent in Jesus. And what this means for us and this definition that Jesus gives is that eternal life isn't something that just starts when you die. It's something that starts when you believe. That when you look to the sun, you're given a new life. That doesn't just start at some undetermined time in the future for you and me. It starts now. That it's a life that's given to us now to live into and enjoy. It is a life that is lived in the fullness of God's presence starting here and now. And Dallas Willard talks about the beauty of this life. And he says the beautiful thing about eternal life isn't that it starts when we die. It's that it starts now and that we never really die. We just keep living. In fact, life only gets richer at the point that we leave this world to go and be with God. 
It just expands. And that the way that we tend to think about death in the terms of loss just kind of falls away at that understanding of eternal life. Because for the one who's looked to the Lord and found life, there is no death. There's just life here, and then there's even more life when we go to be with him. And the wonderful thing about that is not only what that means when we do leave this world, what it means for you and me here and now is that we can enjoy all the wonderful things that we imagine when we think about being with God, where there's no more despair, no more brokenness, where there's just joy and, and hope and peace and all these things that we long for. We can know that now. You don't have to wait. You can embrace the reality of that right now in your life because you can choose to live in the kingdom of God and under the rule, the gracious rule of Jesus right here and right now. And that's the beauty of what John means. When he looks at every one of us and he says, for God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So in the season of Advent, as we get ready to anticipate the, the coming and to celebrate again the coming of Jesus who's come among us, as we begin to anticipate that the one who came to us in Jesus is coming back again, to truly redeem and reconcile this world and to bring us in, into relationship with full relationship in the presence of God again. We come and we look to him. Every one of us for life. And, and so we're going to pray here. And if you want to come down and pray at the altar and, and maybe you want to pray for yourself, maybe you're, you're someone who you just don't know that you ever really look to the sun for life. Maybe you've never said, I'm, I've never been honest with myself about my brokenness and my need. I've been someone who's been sick for a while, but I've never, never acknowledged that it's my own doing. And I've never been humbled enough to look to him for life. Maybe that's you. And maybe you need to come down and pray and say, Jesus, I just, I repent. I'm broken and I need you. I need your grace. I need you to give me life that I can't give myself. Maybe you want to pray for someone you know in your life who's wrestling with that, that you hope their eyes are open to the reality of, of God's love for them and the gift of new life in Jesus. Maybe you just want to come pray on your own terms. You're welcome to come down to the altar as we pray together as a church. But we invite you to come. Father, we come before you in awe of your goodness, in awe that you're the kind of one who would choose to love us even when we are unlovable. And if we're honest with ourselves, God, we have often been unlovable. We often are quite unlovable. And oftentimes our spirit are just like the people in the desert, antagonistic, wanting our own way, not wanting you or your way. And, and God, even though you, you knew the reality of what we would become, it was your heart that compelled you to make us anyways. And you created us and you've loved us and you've sought to perfect us. And to make us whole, even in our brokenness. And you did that. Your love was manifested in that Jesus, your son, came to be our sin for us, to be the sacrifice that we needed. That all we need to do is to understand the brokenness of our own souls and to look to him that we might find true life. And how amazing it is that it isn't just a life that begins when, whenever we die. 
It's a life that can begin here and now. It's a life that's already begun for some of us here. And for those of us who are seeking to receive this gift for the first time, God, we thank you that all we have to do is look. That we don't have to earn, that we don't have to be good enough. All we have to do is look to you. And the true gift of life is given. For some of us, God, we need the courage to fully embrace eternal life. Because right now we feel dragged down. We feel quite vulnerable to the world in which we're living. Would you give us the courage to embrace the fullness of this eternal life and its promises here and now? We thank you for your heart to give. And we don't want to leave this place without receiving again the grace that you have offered us in Jesus Christ. We thank you and we pray all of this in his worthy and holy name. Amen. Amen. Well, I invite us to stand and let's sing together. Thank you for being here. I have just a couple of announcements before we go. Um, one of those is that I think today is the last Sunday for staff Christmas bonuses. So if you want to make a gift, um, be sure just to put and note what it is, um, and we'll make sure it gets to that. Uh, we also have um, coming up right after this in the Family Life Center, starting about 940, we'll have a charge conference meeting. So uh, for our members, you can gather together, and we'll just present two items. We're looking at the 2023 budget and 2023 leadership to vote on because we're running out of time. So uh, we thought that'd be the most efficient use of time. So uh, hopefully there'll be plenty of time for you to have some Sunday school uh, class time as well. But that'll be just go sit in the blue chairs in the FLC and we'll make it happen. Um, also, we have coming up a number of services this week. Uh, so we have coming up on Wednesday what we call the longest night service. And that is a service on winter solstice in which we recognize that you know Christmas and the holidays are for many of us a time of hope and peace and joy. We talk about that, but for many of us, as holidays are a difficult season, and they bring up a sense of loss. They bring up a sense of grief. For many of us, we find ourselves in a transition time, and it's very troubling to us, and so we're in this kind of like, you, you know, odd, odd tension in a season like this, and so the, the longest night service is a time just to bring that and be honest about that before God and to let God minister to us as a people through his promises together. So if that's you, we invite you to join us on, on Wednesday. It'll be at 6.30 here in the sanctuary. And then also on Saturday, we're going to have three worship services for Christmas Eve, uh, one at 4 o'clock in the FLC, kind of our family service. 
And then we'll have a 7 and 9 o'clock candlelight services here in the sanctuary. We invite you to come and invite your friends uh, to come to that. It's a great opportunity to do that. And then Christmas Day, next Sunday, a week from today, we'll have one worship service in here at 10 a.m. Uh, so uh, be ready for that as well. Um, but thank you so much for being here. If you're a first-time guest, we're so glad you're here. We do have a gift for you in the back, so you can see, kind of come uh, out there and turn to the right, and we'll have someone there to offer you uh, a gift, because, you know, if God gave, we can too. And we love you, and, and thank you for being here. Um, but as we get ready to leave this place, let's leave in the hope of the good news of Jesus. That God's so loved because he chooses to love, because he's the one who loves. He's loved us so much that he's given us his most precious son, that we might look to him and find that which is truly life. Amen.